the test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. What have you been up to? I've just been to a tutorial. Weren't you two supposed to attend? Yes, we were. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi there, Sang Min. What have you been up to? I've just been to a tutorial. Weren't you two supposed to attend? Yes, we were. But I had an essay to finish and Julianne offered to help. Did we miss much? Well, I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, it was all about spending habits among undergraduates. It was based on uh, recent research done by a PhD student studying behavioral psychology. Oh, yes. I remember being interviewed by him about what I usually spend my money on. Uh, and what did you say? Well, most of my money, probably around 75%, goes on basic living, uh, paying rent, food costs, and, of course, university fees. I'm the same, except my food bill is higher. <laughs> <laughs> We are all in the same boat here. Mm, virtually all my money goes on that too, but I also spend a lot of money on textbooks, between 100 and 120 pounds a month, usually more. Realistically, it's closer to 150 pounds. <laughs> that explains why you get such good marks. <laughs> <laughs> Another aspect of the interview was students' use of credit cards with a particular focus on how students manage these. In my case, not very well. <laughs> I always end up spending more than I plan to. It's too easy to use. Mm. Surely that must be the point, that students are given credit cards too easily before they've learned how to use them. And the number of credit cards some students get, it's frightening. The average is about three cards? Not only cards. Students need to learn how to manage money, too. And this is what the interviews meant to find out. By comparing and contrasting all the data, the root causes of student spending could be highlighted. And the effects this has on students, I'd imagine, would be more negative than positive. Perhaps, but this was the other part of what the student was trying to achieve. You also need to study the effects to find answers. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. But I think it all goes back to how we were taught to manage money when we were children. That's true. Our behaviour now is closely related to the childhood environment and what we learned from that. But how far back should we go? When do children really begin forming an understanding of what money means? I've read that children between three and five can understand what's right and wrong. That's when they can learn concepts like sharing. At the age of six, most children can understand the value of money. This suggests that if parents offered practical advice to their children at an early age, it could have a very positive impact on their spending habits in later life. Mm. It basically comes down to three areas. The first one is allowance, 
parents should not try to focus on how much money they give their children, but rather on what they need. Needs are difficult to define, so parents need to resist the urge to give in when their children say, I want. Hmm. For me, the only way to teach children the difference between needs and wants is to give them a practical allowance. If my parents had not done that for me when I was younger, I don't think I would be able to handle the money they give me now. Mm, true. The second thing I think is important is saving. Can you explain a bit more? Well, basically, parents need to introduce their children to personal finance. If we are expected to deal with money now, then we have to learn when we're younger. I see what you mean. And it could be in quite simple ways, like by helping them to open their own savings account. Hmm. There's one more area I think is vital. What's that? It's buying. We spend excessively on credit cards because we don't know how to control money. We almost need to learn how and what to buy, which is why parents should allow their children to participate in this. If they want something expensive, like a new pair of trainers, then they could be encouraged to save a bit of their allowance. And parents could also promise to help by saying that they will pay the rest if the child, at the end of their period of saving, still does not have enough. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a male student talking to a union representative about placing an advertisement to sell a laptop. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, I'm Debbie. How can I help? Hi, my name's David. I'm just looking to place an advertisement on the main union notice board to sell a laptop and a few accessories if that's possible. Sure, that's not a problem. I take it you are a member of the Students' Union? Yes, I am. Right then. I'll just get a form up. And as there is no one around, and it looks as if it's going to be quiet for a while, I'll just type the details straight into the computer for you. Thanks very much. No problem. Shall we just title it, Laptop for Sale? Yeah, OK. Can you describe it, generally? Well, it's in very good condition. In fact, it's hardly been used. Why are you selling it, if I may ask? Well, I've got another one which is much lighter and I don't really need two. I see. What weight is the one you're selling? It's uh, 3.5 kilograms. That is heavy these days. Can you give more details about the one you want to sell? Right. Uh, well, it's an Allegro and it's got all the latest programs. OK. What about the memory? The memory is only 0 0.5 gigabytes. And what about the screen size and the other features? Oh, well, uh, the, uh, the screen is, well, let's see, it's 37.5 uh, centimetres with a standard size keyboard and a touchpad. But I've got a cordless mouse that I can put in with it if necessary. Well, some people don't like using a touchpad. What about ports or holes for attaching things to the laptop? It's got two ports. Mm. More modern laptops have more than two ports for all the extra attachments. They do. Uh, let's see, uh, what else is important? Uh, oh yeah, the, uh, the battery lasts for two and a half hours, 
which is okay, but not enough for long train journeys. Uh, but one thing is that it's not wireless. Right, okay, not wireless. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Anything else I can put on the advertisement? There's a webcam built at the top of the screen and uh, I can throw in a printer, a scanner and headphones which I, I got with it in a special deal. It also comes with its own case for carrying it around. Uh, actually, the case is quite smart. I'm hoping these things will help it sell. They should do. Right, I think I've got all that. How much do you want for it? That, I'm not sure about. Uh, it's worth about £900 to £1,000 new. Yeah, but you won't get that much if it's used, and even if it's in good condition. What about £500? I doubt if you'd get as much as that. More like £200 or £300. If you look at the notice board, there is one on there which is comparable to yours, and it's not more than about £250, I think. As little as that? I'm afraid so. Shall we say £300? OK, put that. Can I take some contact details for the advert? The name's David Bristow. B-R-I-S-T-O-W. Yes, that's it. And uh, a mobile or email? Both, if you want. It's... D I B underscore seven seven nine one at hotmail dot com. Okay, and the mobile? Uh, that's O nine eight seven five four two three three eight seven. That's it. If you send the picture, I'll add it and print it out and stick it up for you. Okay, I can get that to you today. Right. I'll type in here, advert placed the 22nd of October. Fine. And good luck with the sale. Thanks. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. And welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good morning, and welcome to this morning's lecture on transport. What I'll be doing today is comparing forms of transport in different countries to see how forms of transport are affected by factors such as geographical landscape and economic development. My focus will be on countries in South America, Europe and Asia. The first country I'd like to look at is Colombia, which is in South America. This is a country where geography plays an important role. Due to the huge amount of mountains and forests in this country, travelling by air is crucial. I don't know if many of you realise this fact, 
but Colombia was the first country to establish a commercial airline, and in so doing they made aviation history. Today, there are more than 400 airports in Colombia for domestic flights, which highlights the point I made earlier, that air travel is a vital means of transport in this country. Colombia also has a road network of about 48,000 kilometres, linking Colombia to Venezuela and Ecuador. Transport by road is important for trade as well as tourism. Apart from this, there is also a railway system, but it is in need of modernisation. The other means of transport is by steamers, with the Magdalena being the main waterway. Now let's turn to Colombia's neighbour, Venezuela. Once again, we see that internal flights are an important means of transport, as like Colombia, Venezuela has remote areas where flying is the easiest means of travelling from A to B. Trains are not popular, and most of the railway lines are in the highlands, as this is where the iron ore mines are. Trains are an efficient means of transporting the iron ore from the mines to the factories. Thus we can see how transport and the economy are interrelated. Ships are also used extensively in this country, and there are many ports, the main seaports being Puerto Cabello and Guanta. Turning now to Europe, Belgium is a country that boasts one of the most compact railway systems worldwide. Inland waterways or canals are also an important means of transport, transporting both freight and people. Belgium also has the third largest seaport in the world, namely Antwerpen. Air travel is also important, although this is not linked to geographical terrain, as is the case in the South American countries we've already looked at. Next, I'd like to look at the United Kingdom. Like Belgium, the UK has inland waterways around 4,000 kilometres, yet only about 17% of these are used for commercial transport. The main inland port is Manchester, and the chief seaport is London, with Southampton taking second place. Air travel is extensive in this country, and there are around 150 airports, the most famous being Heathrow. However, about 90% of passengers in the UK travel by road. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Finally, I'd like to look at two Asian countries. China is a country which reveals how geographical size affects transport development. Roads and railways are widely used, and this has led to a huge amount of bridges being built, such as the Yangtze Bridge, which is probably the most widely known. The Yangtze Bridge is 1.6 kilometres long and is built on two levels. The upper tier is for cars and pedestrians, while the lower is for trains. Railways are especially important, and over 80% of freight and passengers are transported by rail. With such a high proportion of people using trains, it is not surprising that governments in countries like China are prepared to invest in the railway system. Obviously, a fast and effective train service will encourage businesses and the general public to continue using it. The last country I'm going to mention is Japan, which has one of the most advanced transport systems in the world. The railway system is highly developed, and the Takedo Railway, connecting Tokyo and Osaka, has trains that can travel up to 250 kilometres per hour. Ships are also a vital means of transport in both international and domestic areas. To summarise, we can see that transport varies throughout the world, yet the importance of transport networks, be they air, sea, rail or road, cannot be underestimated. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about the geographic information about Australia. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty by choosing the best answers from the choices. Good morning, everybody. We'll continue to look at Australia, and today look at one of its greatest natural challenges: water for the agricultural sector. As the only nation to occupy an entire continent, Australia has a unique environment. With much of it very flat and dry, one notable feature of the Australian continent is that it is the lowest of the continents. The average elevation is less than three hundred meters, compared with the world's mean of seven hundred meters, and its highest mountain is only two thousand two hundred and twenty-eight meters. So, it is overall a very flat country. It is also dry. In fact, Australia is the driest, after Antarctica, of the continents. Yet Australia has extremes of climate and topography. There are rainforests and vast plains in the north, snowfields in the southeast, deserts in the centre, and fertile croplands in the east, south, and southwest. And Australia contains some of the wettest areas on Earth. In western Tasmania, and on the northern Queensland coast, but half of the continent has an annual rainfall of less than three hundred millimeters each year, and only twenty percent has more than six hundred millimeters each year. A major problem is that the limited water resources do not match up with where water is consumed. The major water resources are in northern Australia and Tasmania, whereas most of the agriculture and people are in southeastern mainland Australia. The agricultural sector is the largest consumer of both self-extracted and main supplied water, using over seventy percent of total net water consumption. Electricity and gas supply, and water. Sewerage and drainage services use notable amounts of self-extracted water. However, net consumption in the household sector is the lowest, just eight percent of total net water used. Australia's water use increased by twenty-five percent over the decade between the mid nineteen eighties and mid nineteen nineties. Much of this increase was due to irrigated agriculture. Which, as noted earlier, accounts for over seventy percent of national water demand. Since the mid nineteen nineties, the growth and profitability of irrigated agriculture has outstripped the dryland agriculture sector. Irrigated commodities contributed almost a third of total farm exports in the mid nineteen nineties. The results of a special government report in 2000 showed that if today's water use arrangements continue, the water needs of the rural industries will outstrip water availability by about 2020. Irrigated agriculture, Australia's major water using sector, would be seriously affected by the shortfall, and although groundwater underlies large areas of Australia. It accounts for only four percent of water use. So clearly, apart from water for households, which mainly comes from dams or rivers, 
it is the rural sector where efforts towards water conservation are particularly directed. In this sector, the largest consumers of water are the meat and wool industries. One of the major problems in considering sustainable agriculture is the large amount of irrigated water used to produce these products. Some of the crops, such as wheat, maize and soybeans, also use a lot of water. Furthermore, many crops are grown in dry areas where up to half the available water evaporates from the soil surface or seeps down too low into the ground for the plant roots to reach it. Well, that's all we have time for this morning. You will be able to do further study on this topic in the library, and I have a handout here with references for those who want to come out to the front to collect it. Next week, we'll look at outback farming and... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.